Smallclough Mine is in the centre of the huge Nented Mines complex. The entrance level is about one and a half kilometres southeast of Nented Village. It gave access to the highly profitable pockets of lead ore under the hillsides around the head of the valley that were, in part, discovered from other levels. So it is not an isolated mine. There are vertical links down to ramp gill levels and flats. And it was via these that some of Smallclough's lead ore was transported to the processing site closer to the village. It also had long and complex routeways through to other mine entrances in the Upper Nent Valley, including Middle Clough and Capel Clough. Records show passages extended south towards Garrigill and northeast towards the Cold Clough Valley. These connections are currently blocked and are still being investigated. Smallclough is a fascinating place to visit. Within comparatively short distances underground, there is a wide diversity of mine passages, industrial relics and geological phenomena. Preserved inside, there is much evocative evidence of the lives and skills of the miners who created its many kilometres of passages in their frequently successful search for Galena. There is so much to see that the best journey through the mine is with an informed guide. This film records such a visit in 2019, led by Nenthead mine expert Peter Jackson. And here we're stood at the bottom of one of these shafts, which has now been filled in. You can see the water and the ochre on the wall, and that's where the shaft from the surface originally came down. Old miners found that they could ventilate the mine by sinking shafts from the surface to meet the level that they've driven in. But then below us is an opening into the shaft continuing down, and this goes about 15 metres to a blockage. And the groundwater from the surface is leaching out the iron minerals which are in the rock and depositing them as little waterfalls of iron ochre. Zinc and cadmium are two very troublesome pollutants in the river end and there are various schemes at the moment to extract the zinc from the water to improve the quality. We're walking now into a whimsy chamber where a horse was brought underground. They built big horizontal wooden drums which the ropes wound round and then over a pulley and down the shaft. And so the horse would walk round and round the drum in an underground chamber. There's lots of pick marks on the wall where the mine was just cleaned off the surface so you didn't hit the horse as it walked round the windmill. As we look around the chamber, we can see this roughly circular in shape cut out of the solid rock. A large arch with a timber pole across the front of it, and just below that is where there is a vertical shaft going down. And the horse wind was used to wind the buckets to that shaft 80 feet deep. And you can see here, this is the bearing for the shaft, and here's the top pin that held the shaft in place as well. And here's the bearing block for which the bottom bearing is tapped in, and there's lots of other line work. Really old archaeology, probably dating from about 1800. The geology at Nent Head includes a very thick limestone bed, about 60 feet thick, called the Great Limestone, which was the most favourable bed for the lead and zinc ores. The roof is a very dark, black, loose material called the Black Beds. One of the methods of working was to work upwards because that was a lot easier than digging a hole downwards and having to lift all the waste out with buckets and so on. And they did that by drilling and blasting in the roof with gunpowder, then building a wooden platform, standing on it and drilling up again. The remains of the timbers have either rotted away, broken and so on. Fungus has developed from that rotting wood and then itself has been covered in calcite. Along the level, Black marks on some of the walls show places where miners stuck tallow candles during lunch breaks. 
made of sheep's fat. These were notoriously smoky, but cheap to buy. The mineralization hot fluids have followed the horizontal layers of the limestone rock and replaced it. All the little holes and cavities have been filled up with minerals, these flats. And the miners thought these were great places to work because they were often very full of galena, so they would make a lot of money. The disadvantage is the grey limestone, it's really, really hard. So you need a lot of gunpowder and a lot of sweat and brute strength to drill your holes to do the blasting. Looking at the heaps of rocks that we blasted out and sort through them and any that had no valuable minerals in would be regarded as being dead, not alive if you like, um, and so they would be put on one side. So as well as bringing stone in from outside from quarries, they would often use the deads to build walls to support the working. What we're looking at here is grey, shiny limestone which has been altered by the hot mineralising fluids many millions of years ago. Creamy white and some orange patches and they are a mineral called anchorite or dolomite which is a calcium magnesium carbonate. It has no economic value but it's an indicator to the miners they are likely to find the lead ores and the zinc ores. Galena, which is a lead sulphide, about 60% lead. We can see the shiny grey and silvery colour. In crystallography terms, the galena is a cubic mineral. That means that if we see a really good specimen, it should look like a square cube, very much like a sugar cube. You'll see also that the limestone itself has gone a very orangey colour. That's because there's a certain amount of iron got into the limestone and changed its colour as well. Many of the mineralised pockets of a yellow sulphur colour related to the decomposition of iron sulphides. The blue-green tinge in the core of the decay area is also a secondary result of iron sulphide decomposition. It is melanterite, which is powdery and hydroscopic. We can see natural fault break and if we walk to here on this flat surface, that's actually one of the fault planes coming down here. The roof, we then have another fault plane here. And we can see that there's a thin uh, layer of broken shale fragments with some sandstone and limestone below. Oh, this art looks lovely. This is the mineralisation. Oh, wow. It's amazing the way it grows everywhere. So this just grows in situ, so this is on top of the bricks, so this yeah. is really recent. No, gypsum crystals yeah. on the top. It's all good amazing. fun. You now as you breathe, they're like swinging like this, oh. and of course they break, don't they? There's yeah. some interesting chemistry there, isn't it? They were really good. I think if nobody went down, they would just keep on growing. But if you can imagine it, when it's eight or ten inches long, it's absolutely amazing. It comes and goes. Sometimes you go down there and there's none at all. So was it somebody's job specifically to build the tunnels? Yes, to build the arching, yeah. Right. Some places they, it's in the contract that the miners were paid so much a, 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 dis, a length, a distance, usually a fathom, six or eight feet, yeah. um, to build it arch at the same time. But in some places they paid the miners separately, like as a skilled job almost, to build the arch. Right. So you want to keep this open, so yeah. you would internally have rules that said you would look after these main hard roots by stone arching them. Yeah. Never use timber, because it was too expensive and it rotted. There's a quarry up on top of the hill which is still working, even now. And at the moment they don't get this, it's too, it's too blocky. But at the time this was being built, it apparently broke very easily, on, as you say, on these mm. horizontal layers. And where there's no arch in the rock itself is stayed there? Yeah, not? you'll see further on we're into like massive cave-like chambers in the yeah. limestone. It's just a very thin crust of lime mortar and it, we think we did this in order to improve the airflow. 
So by building a wall and stopping the air dispersing sideways into all the little chambers, you're actually funneling it up to where you want it to be further to our left. Arching. The constructed wooden doors like this and they stuff the edges with bits of sedge and heather from the moors outside to try and make them airtight. But we can see it on the roof here as well. And so we're passing through. You've got a man way and a ladder way. That's right. So the ladder would go up one side and the... the all came down the, the other, other side. Oh. I mean, it's quite impressive, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Hello. Hello. What's it like up there? Ruby. Very big. I can stand up. We need some method of confining the rock we want to come down into a, a fixed space. So the miners built wooden hoppers, so basically they're a box section with a door at the bottom which overhangs the railway track. So when the mine wagon is pulled up and parked below this hopper, the door can be opened and the lead ore that we want is dropped into the mine wagon out of the hopper. George Hetherington was a miner working further into the mine before 1800 and he and his sons had an idea that was a rich part of the mine which had not yet been discovered. The company and all his mates jeered at him and said no chance you're never going to find anything here. So what they used to do was do the shift in the mine for the company and at the end of the shift wait till everybody had left and start to drive their own tunnel in their own time. And what they did was break into these workings that I'm sat in now, which were very rich in lead ore. And that led to the discovery further on of the main small club flats, which were even richer in ore. So it was George and his sons who actually did the development work and found the flats in the first place. Unfortunately for the modern explorer, the tunnels are only about this sort of height. And it's a hands and knees crawl for about 60 metres. So George Hedrington's a bit of a swear word these days. Which they've left an arch there just for support, I suppose. Yeah. So this is where they started, and they drove opposite direction to what we've been travelling. How many sons did he have? It's quite a lot of work for three men, isn't it? Three, yeah. So this is the old section, and then George thought, oh, there's something that way, and he dug that crawl out. Correct. If we look up in the roof here, this, this is a stovework you know, on the fault line where the lead's been found vertically above us, so we've got the slot in the roof. And the company were working here in about 1780. Uh, 1855? Is that the second or the third? Or is it A.G.? I think it's August. A.G. 23. 1855, and a horse. horse and a man with a cart. Mine wagon. Oh, of course, yeah. yeah. And what, what's above? I A. I Archer, well-known mining family. Ah. Or is it a P? No, it's an I. Oh, yeah. no. I Archer, yeah. August 23, With a dot in between, which ah. is what they often used to do. Look at the colour. Yeah. One of the methods of mining is using a pig. How much bigger than this? Into you know, double-ended. So you see these places like this where it's a bit narrow and it just gets narrow and narrow and then stops. Pick the galena out because it was so relatively soft. And there's a phrase in some of the old mines account books about like picking the eyes out. So if you visualise like the galena like we've seen in pockets, you know, it must have been something like that, I think. So you get gypsum from the difference in the One of the chambers in the mine is called the ballroom flat. And this is because in the early 1900s, 
The Freemasons were starting up in Alston and wanted a place to have a large dinner and so the mine company cleared out one of these flats and it became known as the Ballroom Flat. We understand from newspaper reports at the time that the managers of the company and the Masons and their wives uh, were carried in on the mine wagons and had a big banquet in the mine. It was so successful that apparently had another banquet the next year in the same chamber. When we first came into these mines to explore them in the 1960s, we found the floor was still covered with sawdust and bottle tops and candle marks from that time. Geologically it's interesting because you know, we stood on a sloping floor, sloping right down this way, and that's because we're following the bends in the limestone. So when the miners have mined this flat of lead ore out, they've followed the bedding planes. Hobnail boots, I expect, came in later than clogs, didn't they, really? This could be like 1890s. So was this taped off? No, about 1970 it got taped off to try and dissuade people from walking on it. But you can see there are one or two modern footprints here and there. There's a thing called like a Dale's Pony, which is the current version, which is slightly higher, apparently, taller than the originals, but basically the same idea. Very strong legs, short body, not too tall for obvious reasons, and really tough things apparently. Technically the breed is no longer with us, but these Dale's ponies are the nearest you get. The little ballroom is symmetrical and is unlike normal, irregularly shaped flats workings. There is little remaining evidence of vein or cavity mineralization. But the perfectly stacked deads at its entrance imply it was created during ore extraction. It connects with one of those. A bone crawl. The carboniferous rocks that were laid down in seas of which the seafloor kept sinking at different rates. At various times we might have a clear warm sea in which corals could grow and at other times there might be sand coming in from a river delta which lays down a more sandy sandstone. At other times there might be thin mudstones coming down with very low oxygen in the water. So if you look up at the roof up here we've got some very thin grey mudstones and you can see very fine bandings yeah. and that's each seasonal flood as the water has come down the river. Down this sequence here we've got some very yellow sulphury material which is kind of grey and then black material here which is actually a coal seam. So on top of this yellow stone here, we've actually had trees growing in flooded river deltas. Probably very low oxygen in the water at some time, which is why you get the sulphur formation as well. So that's what the yellow colouring is on the rocks here. It doesn't burn. Took some out once in sackfuls and yeah. tried it out, put it on the fire. No. 